Thanks, everybody. Okay, so yeah, my name is Michael McCune. Um, I'm a software developer at Red Hat, um, and I'm going to talk to you today about how to build collaboration and influence open source projects. And so I'll start by kind of like, we'll look at what collaborations are, what influence is, and then I'll share some of my suggestions about you know, what you can do to kind of build those things. But before we do that, I want to issue a couple you know, kind of warnings and whatnot. So I'm going to talk about topics today that are going to, that could lead you to have self-reflection or maybe to question the way you look at the world. Um, I just want to give that as a warning for people who might find that to be uncomfortable. Um, I'm also going to use words and language that talk about more of the social skills that we use in open source interactions or the soft skills that we use. So just kind of be prepared for that. And like this image suggests, everything I'm going to talk about today is just words and images. Like the doing is, is the real part of this. So... The next warning I want to give is that everything I'm going to present today is in my experience. I don't have any sort of like academic studies or, you know, degreed letters to kind of present this from. Um, I'm just going to give you kind of my anecdotal experience, which might lead you to wonder, who am I and why would you want to listen to me? So I'll give you a little bit of my background here. Um, I've been creating software for a long time professionally, using Linux pretty much since it started. Um, in my earliest days, uh, if we start at the bottom and go up, way back in the 1900s, um, I, when I left school, I joined some friends who were starting a gaming company. And my first experiences were writing software for the PlayStation, Sega Saturn, you know, doing low-level kind of writing. And we weren't using really any open source at that point, although I think maybe predictive of where I was going, um, we were using the Cygnus tooling on Windows to run the GCC tools that you would use you know, to make software for PlayStation and, and Saturn. And, you know, the game, the game development career is okay, but it doesn't pay very well. And I was very young at the time, and I needed some money. So I kind of moved back home, and I started doing embedded work at Ford and Chrysler, helping them to create uh, engine testing facilities, basically. And there was nearly no open source involved there, although I did get my first experiences using, like, Unix real-time operating systems and, and writing for those type of things. And eventually I moved on from that and I got involved with a company called Magellan, which is where I worked for probably 10, 15 years. And I became the operating system guy there. And when I started, we were writing global positioning software for an embedded system that used a public domain operating system. This was a, a precursor to micro COS, if any of you are familiar with it. And the source code for that was in a book. So this was a very familiar to me. This is almost getting back to the public domain experience. And I worked there for a long time, and during the course of that work, we started to create a new global positioning product, and I was helping them to create a Linux you know, kernel and file system to run that. And so we built a uh, cross-compiling build chain and everything, and this was at a time when Buildroot and Yocto were very young. And so I you know, kind of went to my manager at one point, and I was like, look, we, we've built this entire system off open source, we've done all this stuff, like... I think we should open source this tool we made and we should share with everyone because it was a powerful cross-compiling tool chain. And I remember what he said to me. He was like, yeah, we don't, we don't really do that here. And for me, at that point, the writing was, was kind of on the wall. Um, and thankfully, a few years later, I got the opportunity to join Red Hat, which is where I've been for the last 10 years now. And when I initially joined Red Hat, uh, I was working on the OpenStack project. And I got a lot of great experience kind of getting into community there. And I became a chair of the, the security SIG and the API working group. And I spent a lot of time working in community there. And then more recently, I switched over uh, to our OpenShift team. And I've been working in the Kubernetes upstream, where, again, I've had some just great experiences becoming part of that community. Um, I participate with the SIGs. And, and I'm a co-chair and a tech lead. And so this is kind of where I'm coming from. And this is where I'm going to talk from about my experiences. So let's start to talk about collaboration. And the way I think about this is kind of like, what, it, what does collaboration look like? It might look like this. It might be a ragtag group of nonconformists who are trying to get together to achieve some mission. But it might also look like this. It might be a group of people who are well-organized, part of a larger group, working towards you know, the betterment of all society. 
Or it might even look like this. And these are the Kubernetes contributors taken from a few years ago. And this is, in my opinion, this is the closest to the collaborations that I've been in that have been the, the most successful. But these are just some examples of what it looks like. What are the qualities of a healthy collaboration? And for me, this starts with everyone is welcome. And you know, there's kind of an English phrase called table stakes. This is talking about you know, when you're gambling, the amount you pay to sit at the table. And for me, everyone is welcome is, is that table stakes. This should be the entry point um, for having a healthy collaboration. And I like to liken it to a drum circle. I don't know, how many, anybody here familiar with a drum circle? Maybe you participated in, like show of hands, anybody? Okay, so where I come from, uh, drum circles are kind of a thing that happens in the summertime. You go to a park, people will be having a barbecue, and you know, oftentimes people will bring their drums with them, and you know, they'll start to circle up, and everyone starts playing, right? And this, to me, it, it implies a lot of things without the explicit need for communication, right? Like you know what's happening. Everyone's kind of you know, going along with the same drum beat. Everyone's kind of bringing their own gear, or maybe you're borrowing something from someone else. You're getting to sit with people who might have more experience than you, they might have less experience than you. They might have better equipment than you, they might have worse equipment than you. But you're all participating in this communal activity and it's very clear what's happening. And so that kind of brings me to my next point, which is have a common goal. So is the project you're involved with or the people you're collaborating with, like? How do you know about them? How do you know how to find them? How do you know what they're doing? And you know, to me, the image that I like to, to bring in here is like, do you, do you know what's happening? Like, do we know what we're doing? Are there artifacts available for me to understand? Like, how is this project operating? Um, and this is a really powerful way to keep the project on track, but it's also a powerful way to let everyone know, like, what are we organizing around? What are we collaborating about? And then another thing for me is that is learning encouraged in the collaboration? Does the atmosphere of the project promote that learning? Do you feel comfortable asking questions? You know, if they seem basic or out of touch, like, you know, do, do you feel like you're gonna be afraid to say something like that? And there's a really powerful image that I kind of thought about this when I was, was going through this. And this is Albert Einstein at Lincoln University in 1946, which, uh, you know, for those of you who aren't from the United States, Lincoln University is what we call a historically black university. Um, because at, at a time when things were less equal in the United States, um, you know, we need to make spaces for people to have, you know, the opportunities to learn. And I think, you know, to me what this speaks about is like, I think Einstein knew about the power of collaboration and he knew about making space for people to learn. And so this is something you know, that I think about when I'm in a collaboration is, can I make space for people to learn even in, a, even in situations where they might not feel comfortable, right? Or, or they might not feel like they want to expose themselves to making like, you know, saying a question and having it be wrong or something. So I think just these are some of the things I think about. So, if, if those are kind of qualities of a healthy collaboration, how can we cultivate those qualities? And I think the first one I start with is be kind. And this, this may seem really, like, really simple and straightforward, but I think, you know, if many of you are like me, you know, I had like parents and, and, and mentors and, you know, friends who kind of imp impressed, you know, that I should be compassionate to those around me. Um, and this is just kind of, for me, it's just kind of a core part of being a decent human, I guess, at some level. But I think it's worth mentioning because I remind myself of this on a regular basis. And, and what I think about, and many of you might have seen this before, this, this quote, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. Has anyone heard this before or seen this phrase? I see some nodding heads, yeah. So I tried to look into the history of this to figure out where it came from. And you know, some people attribute it to Plato and Philo of Alexandria, and more recently people have attributed it to uh, Ian McLaren and John Watson. But there's no clear point of where this came from. Um, but I guess that really doesn't matter because I think the truth of it speaks to all of us, right? And I guess the story that I kind of bring with this, and it's really, it, if, you know, do you all remember the XZ kind of exploit that happened earlier this year or nearly happened, the supply chain exploit? It, when you break apart the details of that, it's a human story, right? It, it, like there was a person maintaining this library and they were having you know, 
they were fighting that hard battle, right? And, and just due to the nature of reality, it kind of ended up the way it did. But think about this when you're getting involved in these collaborations, is how can you, how can you be kind to people? Because we're all going through these issues, and I think this elevates the collaboration by creating an atmosphere where people feel comfortable. So again, state the goals. This is something you can do to help you know, make the collaboration better. So, the, so do you know what you're working towards? When you come to a project, do you know how it's organized? Is it easy to find you know, the ways to get into the project? And you know, this is the question you should ask yourself. Is there an agenda and a roadmap? And if not, why not? These are great ways to get involved in a project. And when you first come to the project, you know, the exercise that I normally do is I just start with the quick start, right? Like, does the quick start work the way it ex I expect it to? And I'll tell you what, like, more often than not, it breaks in some way for me. And usually that's because I'm using some bizarre setup on my local machine. But that becomes an opportunity for you then to become involved, right? You say, hey, look, I found a bug in the quick start. Maybe I can help make this better for the next person. So looking for these types of, you know, artifacts and places where you can get involved are, you know, they're great ways to, to build the collaboration. And, you know, oftentimes as projects mature, those initial artifacts can become kind of bit rotted, right? So even the maintainers and people who've been around the project for a long time might have started to, you know, oh, we didn't realize that doesn't work anymore. So I just, that's a great place to really, to start when you're getting involved. And then be inclusive, you know? This is kind of like being kind, um, but I think it's worth repeating because if you want to promote good health in the collaboration, you want to make sure that people are not being discouraged or actively turned away from the process of collaboration. And so you have to kind of think about how can you include people? How can you not turn them away? And there's another phrase here. I'm, I'm sure many of us have all, you know, assume positive intentions. And this is, you know, the, in corporate land, this is really pushed a lot. And I think, you know, I, I don't know how I feel about it sometimes, but I like to come back to it as a tool to kind of elevate my thinking, right? Yes, not everybody has positive intentions. Yes, there might be bad actors who come to your project. But when I'm doing the day-to-day -day work of like, you know, reviews and, and talking to people, can I put myself in a mental framework where that person who has left a, a critical comment on my PR, on my pull request, you know, can I, um, can I assume that they're not trying to like tear me down or, or make, expose me as some sort of fraud or something like that? I, can't, I not let my mind go to those places. And so for me, that assuming positive intentions, it helps me make good communication choices when I'm, when I'm doing the work of you know, community involvement. So of course, if we do all these things, it'll be a utopia, right? Like everything will just magically work the way we expect it to, right? I mean, not exactly. I, I hear some of you chuckling, and yeah, this, you know, these are guides to help us improve the health of our collaborations. It still takes effort and work. And, and those aren't the only pieces, but those are some of the most prominent pieces in my mind. And I want to make a, just a point to mention that you know, there will be times when conflict arises, right? And I think that's a, that's a whole separate topic of its own. How do you deal with conflict in open source communities? How do you deal with you know, people going against the codes of conduct and whatnot. And I'm not going to dive too deep into that, but only to say that when you're in those situations, you want to go back to the collaboration and look, you know, who is the leadership of the collaboration? Do we have a code of conduct? Are there other people that I can reach out to for help there? Um, and like I said, there's, there's other great talks about that. Uh, that's a topic for another time. So let's turn the corner now and get into influence and see what that looks like. So for me, at a basic level, it might look like this. This is a pull request uh, that I started a while ago, and it took us nearly six months to land this pull request from when we opened it to when we finally merged it. And this is just a pull request that's describing the enhancement. This isn't even the code. And when I joined the team that I'm on now, this was handed to me as like, we need to get this into the upstream, right? And so we had a bunch of code that had taken a year or two to develop, and it was developed by other authors. And they were like, well, Mike, we need to get this into the upstream, like, let's start working on it. So all told, you know, this process took several years to go from the inception of the feature to it landing into the open source project. And my part of it was probably, 
you know, a year or more of doing this work, and I do a lot of maintenance on it now. So this is something to think about that, it, you know, as you're getting into these things, you might have to have these long burns where it's not just I'm putting up a PR and everyone loves it. I might have to go back and, and stick with it and talk to the community and, and build that consensus. Influence might also look like this. You know, we're all, we're all familiar with video chat screens, and this is a, a sample that I just captured from one of the community meetings. I think this is the cluster API project for Kubernetes. Um, you might be able to get involved hosting meetings. You might be able to get involved just participating in a meeting, asking questions. Are you going to the meetings? Does the project have meetings? This is another great way to kind of build influence in those projects. You know, can you get involved in these opportunities? It may also look like this. Um, so this is from KubeCon last year. And uh, myself and one of my colleagues, Joel, and a, and a peer of mine from uh, Microsoft Bridget, uh, we came together to give a talk about what the SIG cloud provider is doing in Kubernetes. And so as, you, as your influence in a project starts to grow, you might see these opportunities. You know, like something I hear very frequently in the Kubernetes community is that we're looking for new faces to come to KubeCon and talk on the maintainer tracks, right? Those opportunities come up very frequently in our upstream meetings. Say, hey, does anyone want to be involved in this process? And so if you're looking for a way to build your influence, this is another great way. You know, listen for these kind of things that are happening. And you know, it can be very daunting to think about giving a talk. Um, you know, I myself get nervous very frequently when giving talks. <laughs> and, uh, but there are people in the community who can help you. And, and this is the part about having a really strong, healthy collaboration is that you say, you know, I would like to be part of a talk. How do I do that? I've never done it before. Ask your fellows, ask your peers. OK, so those are some examples. What is influence then? For me, influence is about relationships. It's about having good relationships with the community and the maintainers of a project. Uh, and it can be really difficult sometimes you know, for those of us who like to focus on more the developer or the engineering side of things where we look at just the hard aspects of the software, you know, it's like, I put up a great pull request. Why doesn't everyone love me, you know? And it's like, well, because it's you're being a jerk, you know? So <laughs> this, is where, yeah, this is where we have to think about how do you foster those good relationships? But let's, like, quantify this a little more. So for me, this is one of the big things. Feeling comfortable to propose changes and criticize processes. When you're in a collaboration, do you feel comfortable to say like, hey, I think we're doing this wrong, you know, or this meeting is this meeting's way too long. Can, can we make it shorter? Do you feel comfortable to do those things? Because if you do, then you're probably in a very healthy collaboration. But if you don't, that's a sign that the collaboration maybe is becoming unhealthy. And likewise, do you have support from the community and its maintainers? And I don't mean, do you have the support to do anything? Do they just rubber stamp whatever you're doing? What I mean is, do you feel that you can bring your ideas and your opinions to them without them you know, trying to tear you down or something, right? Do, do you have the support of the community to have this open process? And again, this is another marker of where you can, you can tell, like, if you want to build your influence, you know, thinking about how you, can, how you can increase this as part of it. So let's talk about that then. How do you grow your influence? What are some techniques that you could use? And I want to I wanna say that it takes two to tango, right? I can do as much as I can, but if, if I'm working with people who don't appreciate what I'm doing or maybe we have a difference of opinion about something that we can't resolve, that's going to be very difficult. So you always have to think about the other side of the party that you're dealing with here. And the first thing that I like to do is fight for the users, especially in open source projects. Uh, this can be extremely powerful for building your influence. And what I mean by this, and I'll, I'm going to switch here to an image that I love from a movie that I love, is can you be the champion for the users in the project that you're in? And I'll use, I'll use like an example here. One of the things I like to do whenever I'm getting into a project is become a user. Do what the users are doing. Learn the problems that they're having, because this is how you become a champion of that. This may not always be clear, depending on the projects that you're working on. I mentioned earlier SIG Cloud Provider in Kubernetes. That's something that I participate with, and I also maintain the software there. How do I become a user of this thing that I'm never going to use at home? 
I, I don't know, how many of you, are anyone here familiar with SIG cloud provider or cloud providers in Kubernetes? This is like a really wonky topic. A, a couple people, yeah. W one of my teammates. <laughs> um, cloud provider is like the layer underneath Kubernetes. It's the interaction between you know, Kubernetes and the cloud that you're running on. You know, it might be AWS or Azure, or OpenStack, whatever. I have no use for this at home. I'm not going to go pay AWS just to like test out these, these things to be a user. But thankfully for me, my employer wants me to do this and is paying me to do it. So I dedicate time out of my day to understand how do I run these things. I'm not just chasing bugs and trying to open pull requests to put new features in. What does it mean to actually operate this software? What are the problems that, that the users who are using this on a day-to-day -day basis, what are those problems? Because if I can understand those things and I can champion those back to the community, I'll not only have influence from the users, but I'll also have good influence with the community as well because they'll recognize, hey, we're trying to elevate this forward. I'm not just creating some feature to put in there. Chop wood, carry water. And, I'll prob and just I'll say right now, I'm probably going to say chop water, carry wood at least once or at least one more time. But it, it happened a lot in my practice sessions. How many people are familiar with this saying, or have at least heard it? Okay, a couple hands. This comes up frequently in open source communities. Um, and I think people throw it around a lot, but like, they don't really think about where it comes from, or there's no explanation about where it comes from. And here, just as an example, this is uh, from the Kubernetes Contributor Awards, uh, the develop, you know, kind of the, the Community Contributor Awards from last year. And they even encoded this saying into like their phrasing, chop pizza, carry boxes. So what, what does this mean, though? The, the history about this comes to us um, from a, like a Buddhist or Zen Buddhist koan, basically. It's a story about a young student and an old student. And, and they're kind of working together. And the young student is going on and on about how, well, you know, when I become enlightened, all this, like, all this work we're doing is going to be gone because I'll be enlightened at that point, right? And, and the older student is kind of like, you know, before enlightenment, chop water, carry wood. This, yeah. Chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. And what he's trying to say is the chopping wood and the carrying water, it's never going to go away, right? Even once you become enlightened. And in this, fray, in this sense, in our, in, our pro, in our projects, even once I become a maintainer or a tech lead or a chair, there's still the day-to-day -day work that needs to be done. The CI has to be kept running. The tests have to be going. You know, the releases have to be made. And someone has to do that work. And so this comes up in open source communities a lot because what the old student was trying to say to the young student was, you need to become comfortable with doing the chopping wood and the carrying of water. And if you can learn to enjoy it, that's even better because these are things that are going to be happening continuously and you need to be part of them, even if you're part of the senior you know, levels of a project. So, I'm not, I'm not suggesting this just to say, oh yeah, you know, love making PRs to fix make files or something, you know, but look for those opportunities where you can take enjoyment in like getting the CI running again or fixing something, you know, because those will come up frequently and you can't always be expected just to say, well, the junior members of the, of the project are gonna take this on. So lead when called. Now this is probably the most subtle of the, of the advice that I'm gonna give here because it, it's diff, it's, there's no way to do it without doing it, right? Like, and what I mean by this is there are many opportunities that come up in the day-to-day -day operation of a FOSS project where people are asking, oh, you know, do you want to lead this? Does anyone want to do that? Could someone you know, make sure the website is all updated and everything? Each one of these can be viewed as a leadership opportunity in its own. And so when those opportunities come, my advice is to lean into them if you can. And I'll, I'll throw up another image here that I love that you know, kind of demonstrates this. This is Star Trek Deep Space Nine, one of my favorite Star Treks. And this is a scene from the very end of the series, so sorry for the spoilers, but you know, this came out in 99. You've had time to catch up. <laughs> the character on the left, who's Worf, for those of you who know, has just defeated the previous leader of their race's empire, the Klingon Empire. And it, and so everyone says, okay, well, you beat him. Now you're the leader. And he's getting caught up in it. And he's about to put the code on and become the leader. And he says, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. There was a piece of advice from our great philosopher 
that said, great people don't seek leadership, they have it thrust upon them. And he turns and he says to this other character on the left, Martok, he says, you know what? I'm not the right person for this. You're the right person for this. And he puts the code on Martok. And the reason I'm bringing this up is to help you be prepared to hear that call. You know, and, and it might sound different depending on what project you're in. You, know, you have to listen to the community maintainers, listen for things like, would anyone like to help with this? Or would anyone be willing to drive this forward? Those are the kind of things that you want to be thinking about and opportunities you want to be looking for. And again, like other things you might be doing, it, it might be challenging for you to say, okay, I'm going to step into a leadership role. But you know, doing difficult things requires us to push ourselves beyond our boundaries. This is the Grand Canyon uh, in the United States. It's a, a great place to visit. If, if you like nature, you know, I definitely recommend going there. But it took five to six million years for this to form the way it did. And the reason I'm putting this up here is because that river, you know, cutting through it, it takes time for it to erode this and make this beautiful site that we see today. But in a similar manner, I think, our efforts in open source projects can be like that. We can be like the river and we just have to keep working. You know, little changes every day. It doesn't have to be some monumental thing. Now, some of you out there, you might be the next Linus Torvalds, right? You might have a project that takes off and goes to the moon. That, that was never me. I, I, you know, I think I've got a grand total of like 10 GitHub stars or whatever across all my projects, right? But what I've learned is that hard work and consistency are very valuable tools that can allow you to kind of grow your influence and, and to become the Linus Torvalds of your own project. But it'll take time and effort, and that's going to be different for each one of us. And that's something you'll have to evaluate as you're in your projects. Now, if you remember back in the beginning when I said the writing was on the wall for me with that job at Magellan, I want to come back to that now um, because I want to talk about why FOSS influence is important, or why you would want to be influential in an open source project. If you're working on a project for your own personal benefit or a passion project, I think that's, that's kind of self-evident. You, know, you, you have an interest in driving it forward. But especially in this day, and I'm, I'm using this slide kind of facetiously, because the enterprise world, the corporate world, is getting more and more involved in open source. And they're putting a lot of money into open source. And many, you know, many of us are paid or will be paid in the future to do this kind of work. And so it's important to understand that open source development is a style of development. And at this point, we have really good evidence to suggest that the work that we've done in open source has actually made the software that we've created better. And by better, you know, I'm talking about uh, more robust, more secure, those kind of things. And, and so, this, taking this message back to your you know, employer potentially and saying, look, you want to have me spend time in an open source community because I can become influential and I can help potentially our users to see the features and the bugs that they want affected in that project. And so you know, any organization that, that kind of wants to see the desires of their users expressed in open source is going to need these type of interactions. And so you don't have to be the maintainer of a project. You don't have to be the most influential person there. But I think it's very easy to make a case for if we believe that open source software development is a better way to build software, then it makes sense for us to participate in those communities. And especially if you think about building a healthy collaboration, what we talked about before, you know, how you can bring those things together. So I wanted, just wanted to come back to that as a touch point. And let's, let's review now what we talked about. Because I, I went kind of fast. I went over a lot of stuff. But I want to boil it down to the points that I, that I really think are important here. Building healthy collaborations. What can you do? You can be kind. You can state the goals. You can be inclusive. Growing your influence. Fight for the users. Chop wood and carry water, and look for those opportunities to lead when they're called. And I'm going to leave you with this. Um, you know, kind of everyone's favorite slide or whatever. Like, we, you know, we talked a lot about a lot of serious topics today. Um, but for me, I also want to note that you have fun out there, right? There's, there's a lot of excitement and, and just great experiences you can have while doing this. If, if you follow these kind of 
you know, if you follow my advice at all, there's a very good chance that you're going to end up meeting a lot of nice people, making friends. You might travel all over the place. And so, you know, remember that as you go out there. It's not all just work, especially when we're talking about building a collaboration and building an open source collaboration. It's okay to make some friends out there, to become closer with people, because that, help, that helps this go forward. And, and if you really believe in kind of the messages of being kind to people and being inclusive, it's going to happen. So, I guess it got done a little bit early. Jakui, and I guess we can have some questions. <laughs> Does anybody have questions? Please. So, yeah, what was the question there? Like, you're saying, should you do that? Should you become the Linus Torvalds of your project and be kind of a jerk to everybody? I mean, I would say no. Like, I don't believe in that. Like, I, I have serious, you know, issue with the way that he treats people. But, uh, yeah, he's said a lot over the years about why he is the way he is, and he's tried to change. I, I think, for me, the point of bringing up Linus Torvalds is that you know, for myself, from my experience, I never had a project where it was like I made it and then like two years later the entire world wanted to use it, right? Or five years later, Red Hat is building a business on top of it, you know, that's now grown to billions of dollars a year, right? That doesn't happen for everybody, you know? And in his case, yeah, his, his jerky behavior drove the project to where it got to. Many, you know, I, if it's not clear from the whiteness in my face and my hair, you know, not my skin, but you know, I've been doing this for a while, and I come from the era when people acted a lot more like Linus Torvalds, right? Like, the engineering groups that I was part of in my earliest days, there was a, a very much a culture of, like, competitiveness, and how can I, you know, if you say something wrong, I'm going to make you look bad in front of everyone, right? And that's at odds with the open source development that we do nowadays, right? Like, I, I can't have a project and, and trying to be, like, slamming someone for the pull request they put up or calling them out for like, you know, the code that, you know, that, that's not cool, right? Like it, the behavior that Linus kind of exemplifies in some of those of his spiciest emails, I guess, you know, that's, that's not behavior that I would want to, to promulgate or continue, right? So no, I would say don't be the Linus Torvalds in terms of the way he acts, but be ready for your project to blow up the way his project did and maybe learn from the positive messages that, that he you know, gave us, right? Because for all the negative that we can look at there, there's a lot of positive growth that came out of the Linux kernel development and the style of open source development that came from that, right? Like that, there are many good things that came from that that helped us to evolve the art as we know it today. So, so yeah, I would say don't act like him, but you know, if you become the center of attention, who, you know, who knows what happens? Like I, Everyone acts differently under the boiler, right? Good question, thank you. <laughs> Even if a little cheeky. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? All right, well, we'll get you off to your next session then. Thank you so much.